Jesus, 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 Jesus. Lord Jesus, King Jesus, the Christ, the Lion and the Lamb, the Alpha and the Omega, the bright morning star, the Rose of Sharon, our helper, our healer, our counselor, King Jesus. Jesus, we confess as your sons and daughters that we cannot understand your word apart from your spirit. So Holy Spirit, we do ask that you would continue to just tender our hearts, plow up the places where we become numb or self-protective or even dubious. Lord, we pray that tonight you would infuse us with your presence in such a way that we would be able to say like David, I saw him. I saw him in the sanctuary. I saw with spirit eyes what I haven't seen before. Thank you, thank you, thank you, God, that you're so much more than a religion. Thank you that you're so much more than external conformity or ethics or morality. You're our peace, you're our hope. Your ever-present help in times of trouble. You are real. Lord, unveil. Unveil. Unveil tonight so that we can be closer. We ask these things, Jesus, by the authority of your name and the authority of the blood you already shed on our behalf. And all of God's people said, amen. I'm a lot older than your other pastors, um, but I, I do ride a motorcycle. When I turn 40, I'm almost 60, I'll be 60 next month, but when I turned 40, I decided if I didn't get a husband, I'm still single, by the way, if you have older like uncles who have jobs and love Jesus. But anyway, when I turned 40, I decided if I turn 40 and I don't yet have a husband, I'm gonna get a Harley. I'm gonna get my first road bike. I grew up riding dirt bikes. And so nobody I liked asked. And so I got my first Harley at 40. And I was raised half Baptist. My mom's Baptist to the bone. My dad is Pentecostal. Hey, Colin. And so um, the, the Baptist part of me has always wanted an excuse to wear leather pants. And so when I bought the bike, I got all these leather pants when I wear them, it sounds like ducks are being killed. There's a whole lot of squeaking. But I love to ride. And one of my favorite places to ride is the Natchez Trace Parkway. And so sometimes I'll just get on my bike. I'll go on the Natchez Trace. I won't have any destination. I just want to get on my bike and just ride. And so I was in that posture not too long ago. The sun was starting to set. I'd just gotten on the Natchez Trace by Leaper's Fork. I'm just driving up the trace, just thoroughly enjoying the moment. Um, if I'm in a really good place, I listen to worship, a lot of belonging. If I'm struggling, I listen to Megan Trainer, who I also love. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, I can't remember who I was listening to, if it was y'all or Megan, but I'm just having a great time. I'm on the trace by myself. And, um, and I thought, oh my goodness, this is just beautiful. Because the sun was starting to set and it was casting like this kind of rosy glow over everything. And I look up to my left and there's a huge herd of deer, probably a hundred deer. And I thought, I've just got to pull over to the shoulder and just sit in this for a minute. How anybody can wonder if there is actually a creator and see things like that, I'm like, y'all need a lobotomy. How in the world can you wonder if there's a creator, if we came from pond scum? I mean, goodness gracious, this is just glorious. And so I pulled my bike over and I'm just sitting on my bike watching the sunset behind those deer kind of filtering through. It was just epic. And then I hear this roar in the distance. I don't know if y'all have been on the trace, but usually it's just bikers and, and motorcyclists. And so I hear this roar and I know immediately it's another Harley because I can tell by that noise. Supposedly it's for safety, but I think it's just they have bad mufflers. And so I thought it's another Harley coming toward me. And I didn't think too much for, I don't know, a minute or two. And then I realized the roar is coming at me. It, it sounds like the roar is coming at me. So I look over my shoulder and there is a much more stereotypical Stereotypical, like not a Bible teacher, you know, posing in black leather. This is like a real biker. He is just pierced head to toe. What skin I could see was tatted. I'm too old, by the way, for tats because at some point it's going to morph into what you did not intend it to be. But he has some really cool tats and, and he's coming 
at me. I mean, his bike is just coming right at me, Pastor Paul, and I thought, oh, yikers. You know, I haven't seen anybody else for 15 minutes. I mean, the sun is almost set. I thought, I'm about to be an episode of Unsolved Mysteries. <laughs> and, and so I felt myself getting a little nervous, and he pulls his bike, I mean, right adjacent to mine, so close I could touch him. And he puts both boots on either side of his bike, and he takes off his helmet. And I was like... <laughs> You know when you're trying to be brave, but you're just sweating like a pig? I mean, I was just like, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus. And he said, are you okay? And I said, yes, sir, I'm okay. And he said, is your bike okay? And I said, yes, sir, it's fine. I just turned it off so it wouldn't alarm the deer. And he said, all right, you need gas? I was like, no, sir, I'm, I'm good. He said, I just wanted to make sure you're okay. If you need any help, I can give you my number. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm good. And he gets on his bike and y'all, he just roars off. And I watched him get smaller and smaller in the distance. And I was like, that is so not how I thought that was gonna go. I just, I had a whole different narrative in my mind. Typecasting really sweet bikers is mild compared to what we do when we typecast our creator redeemer and we do it all the time. We do it all the time. Most of us are so comfortable singing songs about Jesus because we have a mental image of our redeemer and we've got him with hair extensions, hugging lepers, and so he seems approachable. But we think of Father God, Old Testament, and we think of him with a papal hat and white hair and unibrows just waiting to smack us over the head with a Bible if we step out of line. That is so not who our creator redeemer is. First of all, we are loved and adored by a Trinitarian God. Jesus didn't just come on the scene in the New Testament. Uh, I heard a podcast recently where a, a precious woman said that she doesn't believe the Bible is authoritative anymore, but if you're gonna read the Bible as inspirational literature, just read the red letters in the New Testament because that's the only time Jesus spoke. And I was like, oh, you precious moron. That's not <laughs> the only time he spoke. He's been speaking since the very beginning. He didn't just come on the scene in the New Testament. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they've been there since the very beginning. He's a Trinitarian God. St. Augustine, a really smart dead guy, says only the Christian God is a perfect community unto himself. And he says we're made in his image. So we were hardwired for relationship. 96% of the imperatives in the Bible, a fancy word that just means when God says do something, are set in the context of community. He created us for relationship. And all too often we typecast him and we wince thinking that another shoe is gonna drop and that is not who our God is. He is perfectly holy, transcendent, but he condescends to be close to us. We have always been the objects of his affection. There has never been a time that God hasn't loved his people. I'm coming down there because I'm less of a pastor and more of a teacher and I'm a spitter so some of y'all are gonna get wet. But... <laughs> I need to come down and see y'all. He's always been a relational God and we have always been the hearts that he's pursuing. He's not angry in wrath, vengeful God in the Old Testament and sweet Jesus in the New Testament. He has always been perfectly compassionate. He's always been moving us toward redemption. He's always been moving us toward a more intimate relationship with him. We don't understand sometimes the historical context of the Old Testament. And when you look back over scripture through a 21st century lens, a hermeneutic, sometimes we, we misunderstand some of that. We typecast God as punitive or angry. He's holy, he's not angry. He's always been pursuing us. If you brought your Bible, turn to Genesis 12. We're gonna be Old Testament tonight and then we'll get to Jesus because again, he is a Trinitarian God. Genesis chapter 12, I'm reading from the ESV so it might read just a smidge different than the translation you prefer. Now the Lord God said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. This is Genesis chapter 12, verse one. And I will make of you a great nation 
and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, scholars will tell you that is one of the, if not the most comprehensive blessings in the entirety of scripture. God calls this guy out, Abram. And he says, I'm going to bless you. Was God blessing Abram because he was a good guy? No, he's actually a nutter. He worshiped the moon and the stars before he engages with God. So he doesn't bring any inherent faithfulness to the, to the party. God just says, I'm gonna choose you because I love my people. And I'm gonna set my favor on you. And even though you and Sarah are wearing Depends, y'all are gonna have to go to Costco for Pampers because I'm gonna have a whole nation come from you and Sarah. And he says, also, I'm gonna dishonor, I'm gonna curse anybody who doesn't bless you. So he doesn't just say, I'm gonna bless you. He says, I'm gonna make everybody around you bless you. You have fabulous hair, by the way. I know that's not spiritual, but I felt like I should say it. <laughs> He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to curse anybody around you who doesn't bless you. When I was driving here, I live in Thompson Station, and there's a bunch of traffic on 65, and so I had to get on 440, and there were hateful people who wouldn't let me merge. <laughs> well, God says to Abram, if there's hateful people, probably from California, who won't let you merge, <laughs> I'm teasing. Mostly. Um, he said, if there's hateful people who won't let you merge, I'm gonna curse them, they're gonna get hives. So it's a 360 degree blessing. Abram, I guarantee I'm blessing you all the way around. There's just one caveat, there's one caveat. I'm gonna bless you and there's only one thing you have to do, Abram. What does he have to do? He has to move. He lives in a place called Ur. And I like to think of Ur as like Franklin. And you know, it's kind of epic. Everybody knows everybody. You know, all the women are in grow groups and Weight Watchers groups. The guys go ax throwing together. It's just like this super tight community. And God says, I'm gonna bless you, Abram. The only caveat is you've gotta move from the place you've grown really, really comfortable. That's a word for somebody. We tend to go, I wanna stay right in my comfort zone, right in my lane, and then God, you just bless my lane. I was with some really precious women recently and we were talking about blessing. And this young woman said, Miss Lisa, I have been praying for like the last year for blessing. I mean, I've been running hard toward the Lord. I'm, I'm in church every time the doors are open. I am not just tithing, I'm giving sacrificially. I mean, I'm all in and my life is still a hot mess. I just haven't gotten the blessing. And she said, I was just telling my boyfriend at, at breakfast yesterday when I came in for my quiet time and he was sitting there having breakfast and I was telling him, I feel like I'm just missing the blessing. And I said, hang on, sweetie. I said, did you just say your boyfriend was at the breakfast table? Now y'all hear me. I'm 59. I don't want to sh throw shade at anybody. Lord have mercy. If there's a sin to be committed, I have committed it. And God has graciously pulled me up out of pits I dug myself. So I am not speaking from a place of moral superiority. But if we know God, there are some things in here that are really clear. And I said, honey, it's clear in there. There's a lot of things that, that we don't know. It's hard to understand the context, but it's really clear in there that if you're gonna get jiggy with him, he needs to put a ring on it. That's just clear. <laughs> that's not me. That's not denominational. That's just scripture. And I said, you probably need to move from a place where you are practicing idolatry because you're getting your needs met by this man who sounds like a player and that's okay, but you're not gonna have intimacy with God if you willfully go, I don't wanna do that if he's told you to do something. God says to Abram, move. They've been living in Ur slash Franklin a long time. Can you imagine Sarah's reticence? She's like, I love everybody here. These are my people. I don't want to move from this place. Plus, we finally just did a kitchen remodel and I've got courts. I don't want to move. And he says, baby, Yahweh says we have to move. Do you know God was referred to as a title and then he gave his name when he began to relate to people. He lets Abram call him his name, Yahweh. 
He says, Yahweh told me we have to move. And so they move. And they move to a completely new place and God doesn't give them directions. They have no GPS. They move blindly, trusting the Lord. And they move to this new place. And after they've been there a year, Sarah thinks that everything's gonna be hunky-dory. She's gonna get a high metabolism and she's gonna get pregnant because remember, she's old too. And it doesn't happen for her. And on the anniversary of their move, this is hyperbolic, this is not in Holy Writ, so I'm just reading between the lines. But I can imagine on the anniversary of their move from Ur, the place that she was so comfortable in, the place that she loved, with the people she loved, she was like, where's the blessing? I don't see it. We're completely invested. Where is the blessing? He's like, baby, it's coming. Baby, it's coming. Second year, no blessing. Third year, no blessing. Fourth year, no blessing. Fifth year, no blessing. Have you ever been in a place where you thought, you told me to give this up, you told me to invest? Were you just just playing me? Because I'm not getting the reward. It's amazing how we as the created demand reciprocity from the creator of the universe. Genesis chapter 15, after these things, he's been in a strange place for a long time, hasn't gotten the blessing, and he's honest about it. Man, I love it when people are honest about being disappointed with God. I hate posers. I shouldn't say I hate them, but I hate the whole fakey, especially Southern Christian thing. I asked a woman recently how I could pray for her, and she said, oh, I don't need prayer. And I was like, you're about to, after I (laughs) kick you in the shins for being a liar. I love that Abram's honest here. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. Do you hear the disappointment there? I mean, he's like, This isn't what I thought my life would look like, God. I thought if I did my part, you would do your part. I thought we were going to have kids. I thought you were gonna bless us. I love that God allows him to speak his disappointment. Y'all, we don't have to curate our emotions with God. That comes from a human construct. It's a human construct that says you can only bring the perky positive emotions to God. That is not biblically defensible. He allows his people. What a good God because he knows that that we can't see everything clearly. He knows we're bound by time and space. He allows us to come toward him in disappointment. Isn't that amazing? I love that he's such a patient God. Abram says, I think you were being figurative. I think you were just being maybe hyperbolic because I got no blessing, I got no kids. Now we're too tired to even sleep together. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Y'all, this is God's voice. This this isn't an angelic emissary. This is the voice of God. Have you ever wondered what the voice of God sounds like? I always think he sounds like the guy in the Allstate commercial. You know that real (laughs) deep voice? I'm gonna be so flustered if we get to glory and God is a tenor. (laughs) The word of the Lord came to him. This man is God's voice. This man shall not be your heir, your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then God said to Abram, so shall your offspring be. Verse six, and he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. Verse six is why we have Hebrews 11 in the New Testament because Hebrews 11, the hall of faith chapter is where we hear that Abram is a man of faith. He's listed in Hebrews 11 because of Genesis 15. He believed God when God said, trust me, I told you we're gonna have kids. Trust me, he believed him. How long did he believe God? How long was he faithful? One verse, one verse. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. But he said, one verse after he believed believed God, verse eight, but he said, this is Abram, oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? What a whiny baby, one verse. He believes the Lord and then he gets distracted by his circumstances. And then he typecast God as a God who's not fair. 
as a God who's far away. Listen to God's response. It is stunning, y'all. God says to Abram, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And then he says, Abram, I want you to bring these animals to me. And I want you to cut these animals in half. And I want you to go to Home Depot. And I want you to get a rototiller. And I want you to have a trench between the animals that are cut in half. John Michael and Sam, would y'all bring out the props? I don't ever do props, but I wanted y'all to get this. And those of y'all who have kids in your life, they're not Old Testament, but they were in Missy's room, my daughter's room, and so I thought these will, these will work well enough. So he says, I want you to get these animals. Uh, Sonic is a real Levitical animal. So I want you to get these animals, and I want you to create, I want you to cut them in half, and I want you to create a trench between the animals. So just imagine, they, they've got animals from their herds, they're cut in half, pretty barbaric culture, and God says, I want you to create a trench. And if you keep reading Genesis 15, Abram doesn't balk. As barbaric as this is, Abram doesn't balk when the God says to do that. Why doesn't he balk? Y'all can talk back, I'm not your pastor. Why doesn't he balk? He's done it before. He's done it before. This is a pre-literate culture. They don't have written contracts. So when you made an agreement with someone, you symbolized the agreement. You don't have a written contract. And so the most binding agreement two clans or two people groups would make with each other is called a blood covenant. A blood covenant was most often done when you had a, a guy from one people group marry a girl from another people group. And what would happen, um, actually I need one more prop. Steph, can I get you to come up? Um, Steph, do you have a brother? Is he married? Boogers. Okay, let's pretend, <laughs> let's pretend that you have um, a brother named Harry who's not married and I fall madly in love with Steph's older brother, Harry. And so, what did everybody call your dad? Like, Mr. Zonk? Uh, yeah, Mr. Sancho. Okay, so, so let's say um, I'm marrying Harry, Steph's brother. Um, my dad, my dad's name was Everett Harper. He was a contractor. My dad would bring animals from our flocks. Steph's dad would bring animals from their flocks. They would bring them together, cut them in half. They would have a trench between the animals that had been cut in half. And then one at a time, Steph, come here. The fathers would walk through the blood. You have to walk like your dad. Your dad was a sissy. Steph, your dad was a bad, bad sissy. That is a bad daddy walk. So, so Steph's dad would walk through getting the blood on his ankles. My dad, my dad was kind of more, kind of miniature John Wayne. I probably didn't do that well either. But our dads would walk through and when both of our fathers had walked through the blood covenant, they would say to each other, if the covenant, the marriage covenant between Lisa and Harry is severed, then may what was done to be, these animals be done to us. When you had marriage, it was a clan marriage. It was covenantal. It was a serious thing. So when God says to Abram, actually, let me take a caveat. Um, let's take this a step further. Let's pretend your dad is a king. Okay. So I'm marrying Prince Harry. I thought that was kind of witty. So I'm marrying Prince <laughs> Harry. Um, what would happen then? Would both of our fathers walk through if, if I come from a contractor and Harry comes from a king? Uh-uh. No, her dad wouldn't have to walk through the blood covenant then because he's already proven that he has collateral. Only the commoner would have to walk through if you've got marriage between royalty and a commoner. Thank you, you've been amazing. And so, except for that sissy walk. And so, so when God says to Abram, I want you to get these animals, cut them in half, Abram's like, oh cool, we're doing a blood covenant. I know exactly what we're doing. Then what happens next, y'all, it is so stunning. I hope the veil gets thinner for some of y'all. What happens next is it says Abram falls asleep 
In the actual Hebrew, Pastor Paul can tell you, that doesn't mean he's unconscious. It actually means the Holy Spirit was holding him down, the kind of verbiage they use there. So Abram actually sees what happens next. And what happens next is a flaming torch and a smoking fire pot pass between the pieces. The fancy word for the flaming torch and the smoking fire pot is a theophany. That means a physical manifestation of God. You remember when God came down in the form of a cloud. Remember how he hovered over the Israelites as a cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. You remember when he spoke to Moses through a flaming topiary. Those are theophanies, physical manifestations that humans can see with our eyes of God himself. This is the very first time in the Bible that we've got a theophany. In theological circles, that's called the law of first mention. It means it's a really, really big deal. What God is saying to Abram, our great, 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 and then some granddaddy is, when the covenant, when the relationship between us is severed, and it will be, because I created you, and I know there will be seasons when you typecast me, I know there will be seasons when I don't bless you based on your plans that you wonder if I'm actually a good God. There will be seasons when the covenant between us is, is strained. And when that happens, Abram, representing all of humanity, the king of all kings, I'll pay the price in blood. If you ask people, What's the significance of those old hymns? There's power in the blood, nothing but the blood. We almost always say, well, it goes back to the Jewish sacrificial system. Oh no, it goes much further back than that. From the very beginning, God has been saying, you're the object of my affection. I love you. I've set my favor on you. Even when you turn your back on me, my arm is not too short to rescue you. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. It's just most of us have been so poorly loved this side of glory that it sounds like a fairy tale. We sing about the love of God, but most of us labor with our heads down, wondering when the other shoe is gonna drop. I got to become a mom through the miracle of adoption. Brought my little girl home from Haiti the year I turned 50. So I teased on Sunday and said I went through menopause and motherhood at the exact same time. And um, I don't deserve to be your mom. My, my kid is extraordinary. Her first mama died from undiagnosed AIDS when my, my little girl was a baby. And Tracy Hamilton went with me to bring her home after two years. But Missy was not well loved at the orphanage. As a matter of fact, she was the first and the last child uh, with her particular medical condition at that orphanage. And so she was beaten by the nannies. She was not held. She was not well received at all. And so when I would tell her that I loved her, there was a wall up. She kind of thought of me as, uh, she called me Mama Blanc, white mama. But she thought of me really as kind of Santa Claus with whiter hips because I would go and she'd get to eat more and I'd, I'd bring her shoes. And it was a two year adoption process. I brought her home April 14th of 2014. And the very first thing I did the very first night is I got in her little bed and I said, Missy, Mama Blanc, Rin Man U, I love you. I said, U Tre Brave, you're very brave. U Tre Belle, you're very beautiful. U Tre Intelligent, you're very smart. I love you very, very much and Jesus loves you more. And she wouldn't look at me. She couldn't meet my gaze. And her little four-year-old heart, all she'd really experienced was abandonment. So what I was saying sounded like a fairy tale. But our counselor said, Lisa, consistency is the currency of love for Missy. Won't you just be consistent? And so every night I'd repeat that mantra Every night I'd lie in bed with her. I gained like 15 pounds first couple of weeks she was home because I thought since Chick-fil-A was a Christian company, it didn't have any calories. And she (laughs) loved Chick-fil-A, so I even grew a little valley for her to stick her toes in, but she just would not look at me. And night after night, I'd say, Utre Belle, 
ou très brave, ou très intelligent. Ma rin man, ou. And Jesus loves you more. He loves you so much more. And after a month, I can still remember the night, y'all. She had crawled her little toes up and stuck her toes in my valley of mercy. <laughs> and I began that mantra I had said so many times before, outre brave, outre belle, outre intelligent. I love you so, so, so much, baby. And Jesus loves you more. And for the very first time, she looked into my eyes the very first time, just met my gaze as I was telling her how much I loved her. And she went, Mama, Ren, Missy, Mama loves me. And I was like, oh, honey, I'll spend the rest of my life proving to you that you, you are everything to me. You have the biggest territory in my heart. You're the greatest gift other than salvation that God has given me and I'll spend the rest of my life loving you. Y'all, my love for my kid is a drop in the bucket compared to God's love for us. And he's been saying it from the very beginning, from the very, very beginning. He's saying, you are always the one for me. I'll walk through everything for you. When you turn your back on me and you don't think I'm blessing you, I will pursue you. I'll chase you. Psalm 23, when it says that surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives. In Hebrew, that doesn't mean a caboose. It means God is chasing us with goodness. He loves you. 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 Let me ask y'all to stand up. As Pastor West comes to close this family meeting, and I wanna ask you a question. And I do understand I'm a guest here at The Belonging. I love Alex and Henry. Uh, Alex is a sister to me. I don't have words to wrap around how much I respect your leaders in this house. I love this church. And so I wanna be really respectful. I have not earned the right to be quite so bossy with y'all, but I'm gonna be bossy because I'm old. <laughs> I wanna ask you this question. And as best you can, I want you to answer it honestly, just within the privacy of your own heart, your own relationship with God. If Jesus were standing in the room tonight as a theophany, you could see him. You could see the olive tone of his Jewish incarnate skin. You could see his eyes that John tells us in Revelation are blazing. You see his countenance filled with compassion. And he said, I love you, I love you, I love you. Could you meet his gaze? Could you meet his gaze? Are you a kid who can look into the countenance of your creator, redeemer? believing that you are the object of his affection. We're gonna worship and Wes is gonna ask you some more questions. But I wanna open up this space up here for prayer because I spent about 30 years of my life with my head down. I came to Christ when I was a little girl. I was five years old. My dad had left us for another woman. Soon after that, my mom took me to a new church because there was so much gossip in our church that she had to go to another place. And my first Sunday in the new church, this pastor I'd never seen before started talking about how much our God loves us, that our God is a father who never turns his back on his children. And I remember thinking, could that be true for a girl like me? By that point in my story, there had already been some significant molestation. I felt dirty, I felt dirty for as long as I could remember. But I thought maybe, just maybe, if I give my heart to Jesus, it's in his job description to save me. 
So I became a follower of Christ as a five-year-old little girl. But I kept my head down and I just tried to be good because I thought if God looks under the hood of my life, he will be so disappointed. He will regret the fact that he lowered the bar to let me into the kingdom because I do not have it all together. I've got so many mistakes in my backstory. So for decades, I was the kid who performed. I couldn't be held. I couldn't look up. I believed God delivered me. I didn't think he delighted in me. It's only been, I don't know, probably the last 15 years that I've learned what it is to be held. I can walk before the Lord with my face up, expecting to see his countenance lit with compassion instead of lit with disappointment. If you have a hard time believing that a perfect God like that could delight in a man or a woman like you, that you are the object of his affection, that it's always been you, that's always, ever, only been you. If you have a hard time hanging on to that, will you just come forward tonight? No shame whatsoever in that. Actually, there's tremendous, tremendous grace and courage to say, I wanna lean in more fully. I don't wanna just know things about God. I wanna be held by God. I wanna walk before him with confidence, believing that when he sees me, his face splits into a grin. We're just gonna open the altar. Um, If you are in a season of wandering, maybe a couple of years ago, you felt so close to the Lord. You may remember the very first worship service in this building, and you remember thinking you were gonna levitate. And you keep coming back, hoping to regain that emotional connection, but you feel like your prayers are hitting the ceiling. If you're in a place where you just feel like there's distance between you and God, you believe, but it feels like he's unapproachable. The intimacy with him is unattainable lately. Will you come forward? He doesn't want you stuck. He doesn't want you stuck. He came for you, he loves you. Y'all come forward if you're standing next to somebody and you know their story and you know they're in a difficult season, maybe because of something going on in their family, maybe something that happened to them that broke their heart and they are still just walking wounded, really unsure of anybody's love, including God's. Would you say to them right now, I'd love to go forward with you. Thank you for trusting me with your story. I'd love to go forward with you because he loves you, he loves you, he loves you, he loves you, he loves you. You are the object of God's affection.